May I now invite Prof. Barber to give his uh, talk, Professor James Barber. say after that. I, I feel I've now got to give an introduction uh, about the president and his work. Um, uh, as it happens, he also has worked on photosynthesis and we got to know each other when we were both very young and, and promising. I was a little bit older than him, but we exchanged some letters without knowing each other because we have very similar ideas about things. And um, I've just been in communication with uh, one of well, who was actually a, a, an opponent at the time um, on a certain aspect of photosynthesis, uh, Charlie Anson. And I always remember Bertel and I saying, one day he will understand. But anyway, Charlie Anson became president of a university and rose high up in the system in the United States. So he did very well for himself, just like Bertel. Now, I, um, I'm going to talk mainly about um, uh, forming the OO bond of oxygen. And I'm going to do it within the concept of ba ba basically natural photosynthesis, but I will talk about artificial photosynthesis because they relate together. Now, I'm, we all are aware that this planet is powered by sunshine. Of course, sun falls onto Mars, it falls onto Venus, it falls onto the moon, but on this planet, the sun, like the energy, the solar energy, is captured and utilized to, uh, if you like, its negative entropy. It builds structure. It's the, it's the source of the structure of our planet, where both uh, living organisms and also, of course, what living organisms do, all our buildings and so on, are powered essentially by the sun, um, one way or another. Now, uh, and we, all, we all know this statement that one hour of sunlight is equal to all the energy we use uh, in a whole year. So actually, planet Earth is energy rich. So when we talk about the future energy supplies for the planet with the ever-increasing population, we do have a resource that we can use, and there is no other resource equivalent to it. And uh, the challenge is to use this rather diffuse resource and bring, it, uh, and bring it in such a way that we can utilize it in the way we do today and we'll have to in the future. Now, we, we do have the technology uh, uh, to capture sunlight, uh, of which there are basically three. One is, of course, photovoltaics, and uh, which uh, many of you work on who are in the audience, turning uh, light energy into electricity. But, of course, wind is also solar because you have the differential heating at the, at the uh, equator here around and the, and the poles, and this generates the wind. So all the wind energy is really solar energy. Um, and of course, hydroelectric is also a solar energy. We need the sunshine to evaporate off the water uh, and, and distribute it in ways such that uh, at different elevations so that we end up with the potential of, of hydroelectric power. So um, these are, um, uh, uh, three sources of solar energy that we use at the moment. And if you take the current use of those at this moment, we know photovoltaics is increasing. Wind, of course, has been a lot of effort into wind in recent years. And, of course, hydroelectric has a, uh, uh, has a well established uh, uh, platform on the, uh, uh, for uh, supplying power. It's about 10% of our total energy consumption. Um, now, the rest of it, of course, is fossil fuels. And uh, uh, the fossil fuels, of course, have been derived from sunlight. So every time we burn coal, gas, or, uh, or um, uh, uh, oil, we're actually uh, releasing the energy of sunlight, which has been stored by photosynthesis over millions of years. Now, the question that I think that we have to address for the future uh, is, uh, is to capture more of the sunlight and on the other hand, also store it so that we can get a high energy fuel, as we do with uh, fossil fuels. So the, the, the challenge is, uh, is storage, uh, so, uh, and storage with high energy density. We cannot, we've got two ways of storing electricity, batteries electrochemically or in chemical bonds. If we don't store it electrochemically and we're spending a lot of time and effort in trying to develop batteries, better and better batteries, we will never fly, I believe, I should never say we never, uh, 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 an aeroplane like the, like the 380 um, uh, uh, with batteries because we need oomph in, uh, uh, to get uh, 
airplanes into the air and so on. So we need high, and, and rockets and so on. So we need high energy density. And of course, uh, liquid fuels are ideal. And uh, so we want to have storage, and if idea, ideally to have storage in chemical bonds. So the, uh, the perfect, oh, excuse me, I'm going to get muddled up here. I'm, oh, I'm, I want to go back. I'm going for, uh, uh, good. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, this, is, therefore, is a perfect cycle. It's the cycle where we take water as a hydrogen source, split it into oxygen and hydrogen, and use the hydrogen as a fuel to burn again with oxygen back to water. Just a water cycle. This is the perfect solution. Uh, and we have lots of solar energy in excess of our needs. So can we develop a whole infrastructure of renewable energy based on taking hydrogen out of water? That's what uh, we want to do. Um, now, we might use the hydrogen directly. It's a very uh, high energy fuel, uh, de high density fuel. Or we may want to use it chemically as a reductant to change, for example, carbon dioxide into some liquid or gaseous fuel. Uh, like methanol or methane. Uh, well, actually, funny enough, biology, not surprise, surprise, invented this, doing this, uh, three billion years ago. The split water, when, when uh, that, that was the beginning of, of, of oxygenic photosynthesis, to split water into oxygen and hydrogen and store the hydrogen or reducing equivalents as organic molecules by reducing CO2 to uh, biomass and, of course, the food we eat, the fossil fuels. So this is um, what biology did and, um, and what has driven our planet and probably makes our planet totally unique, maybe in the universe. I'm not convinced that there's another, well, how we, none of us know. There may, well not, there may not be another uh, uh, heavenly body in the, in the universe that is the same as this planet, although people think there might be. Of course, it's very difficult because there's millions and trillions of stars and planets. But we don't know. But it's a very unique situation to have liquid water to use uh, on the planet, which is uh, partly due to its positioning with the sun and the presence of the moon, and to have uh, a temperature range which is just right for liquid water. It's only a small temperature range. So we, uh, planet Earth is very, very special. And, and of course, uh, we use that uh, stored energy. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do a, a, a the, uh, that's, that's what I got to do. Um, we use this stored energy by oxidizing again with oxygen back to water, and we get out energy. We decrease entropy, and we create heat. OK, so um, that, that is photosynthesis, and it's almost it was almost cyclic, but we were laying down organic molecules. Of course, today, the, the cycle is still not, uh, the, sorry, the, yes, the, it's not truly cyclic today because we're, re we're, we're releasing more CO2 than we're fixing through photosynthesis. Now, how does photosynthesis do it? it, it, it this is a very, very simple diagram of the uh, electron transport in, um, in photosynthesis where we have actually a tandem system. We call one photosystem two and one photosystem one. And the, uh, this, uh, these names uh, have a, a history of how they became system one and system two. These are chlorophylls where energy is uh, absorbed from sunlight and excitations are transferred to um, uh, components which bring about charge separation. This is a chlorophyll, actually. And there we form, we form a highly oxidizing equivalent here, which is able to take electrons out of water. Now, that has to happen four times to get an oxygen molecule. So it's a four-photon process to produce a, a full dioxygen. Uh, the second light reaction is a, a pumping reaction, really. It's taking electrons and pumping them up the energy scale here, such that they are now reduced, sufficiently reducing to make hydrogen which is done biologically by making a, a molecule NADPH2, that's the hydrogen. And that is then used to drive carbon dioxide fixation, it's missing the CO2 here, to make the carbohydrates and other organic molecules. This is how nature does it, four photon process. Now, um, as briefly mentioned by in the introduction, um, photosystem two. Oh, I, 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 I do would like to say that you can see that there's a difference between photosystem one and photosystem two, in that um, photosystem two um, does chemistry. It does the water splitting reaction. This is simply uh, a pump. 
to take, give more energy to the electron. So here's the chemistry going on here, the water splitting chemistry. Um, and that photosystem too is far more complicated than drawn on that simple uh, cartoon. It consists of many different proteins. In fact, there's over 20 different or 20 or more uh, different proteins that make up this unit. And as, uh, as uh, Professor Anderson said, it's buried in a membrane. It's very complicated. It's very large. And the idea that we could possibly isolate it and, and, and obtain its structure, as you said, it seemed impossible a few years ago. Now, the, all I want to emphasize here, because it's too complicated, but these are all different proteins, but is where does the water splitting reaction occur? It occurs here. Uh, here, uh, at, at this ma cluster of manganese and a calcium ion, and this is where the charge storage occurs because you have to accumulate four positive charges, four oxidizing equivalents, in order to make one oxygen molecule, as I've said. And this is, um, so to do that, you have, uh, it's a cycle. We call it the S-state cycle, in which you see a progressive, um, oh, oh, I'm, damn it, I'm, <laughs> I knew I'd do this. Uh, uh, a, prog a, a progression from, say, S0, you give a flash of light and it goes to S1, and you see a manganese becomes oxidized. There was now two manganese 4. Now you've got three manganese 4 with another flash of light. There's that P680 oxidant and a tyrosine, which is uh, intermediate between this. And then you go to uh, S3, and you get, at that stage, you've got four oxidized, uh, you've got four manganese um, 4 plus and you accumulate three oxidizing potentials, and then the last flash produces S4, S4, big question mark. What is the nature of S4? What is, what is the chemistry that goes on there that forms a dioxygen bond? It is not easy to form a dioxygen bond because an oxygen atom is so reactive, so it has to be very specially um, um, uh, constructed to get the two oxygens together to form a dioxygen. It's not a trivial process, and it's occurring in the delicate environment of a protein. So the storage is done by manganese ions. Now, the question is, if we're going to understand this magic and very special reaction of our planet, we need to understand the structure of the enzyme. And this is true of any enzyme, of course, that we get, uh, uh, we have to have the structure to understand its mechanism. And in, as, as again was in, said in the, uh, in the introduction by the president, that, that, um, that um, the, about 1994, I think, I made a decision in my lab that we had to get the structure if, if we were going to understand the mechanism. Now, as it said, we had a structure of uh, some hints from a bacterial reaction center a structure that got the Nobel Prize. But this was our first images of the photosystem II complex isolated. It was dimeric. And from that, we were able to grow two-dimensional crystals. Once you get order, uh, you can start to get structure. And from that, by 2000, we already had an idea of the arrangement of the various helices that make up those proteins, those uh, uh, 19 different proteins, actually. But this wasn't, the resolution wasn't high enough to be able to see the manganese cluster. And we turned to X-ray crystallography. And to do X-ray crystallography, you have to grow crystals. And this is what we did using a cyanobacterial system. And we obtained a full structure, actually in 2003, published in 2004, of photosystem two. And there's the side view of the dimer. Um, showing um, all the different helices that make up those various proteins. I know not all of you are biochemists in the audience, but there are those tubes are helices, alpha helices going across the membrane. There's some extrinsic proteins here. And, um, and there were, in total, we uh, identified at 3.5 angstroms, um, fi over 5,000 amino acids, and um, with nearly 50,000 atoms were identified to get this structure. All the proteins were rarely determined, and even today, with high resolution structure, they were, they were uh, right. Nothing has been controversial at all. So we, we, it, we did a good job in 2004, and it's published in Science. Um, we could also, of course, see, uh, which is the focus of this talk, the manganese cluster here, and there's a calcium as well, uh, cited here on this one side of this uh, of of, 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 of two-dimensional 
say there are two fold axes that goes through here. And overall, there were nine, every monomer, there's a dimer, every monomer contained 19 protein subunits. I mentioned 16 were intrinsic, that means in the membrane, three extrinsic. There were 35 transmembrane helices per monomer, and, and we identified set, uh, 57 different cofactors, including the light harvesting chlorophyll molecules. Um, and what we concluded um, was that the, this man, uh, oh, I'm doing it again. Oh, I'm so I, angry with myself. I hope you will excuse me. Um, we identified uh, this manganese cluster, and we could see it had a very unusual geometry. It was three manganese and the calcium forming a cubane bridged by oxygens, and there was a fourth manganese, manganese 4, which was, you could call it a dangler that was um, uh, coming out from the cubane. And uh, then there were a number of amino acids around acting as ligands to the structure. I wanted to just, um, uh, just quote this, um, this uh, abstract from our science paper in 2004, and I guess jump down to here. Um, uh, it, it says the data strongly suggests that the OEC, oxygen evolving complex, contains a cubane like manganese 3 calcium O4 cluster linked to a fourth manganese by a, a mono mu oxo bridge. And this were, was a diagram that we put in that science paper at the time with my colleagues from Imperial College. Um, here I go again. Um, and you see, there's the cubane with the three manganese and the calcium. And there uh, uh, is the manganese four outside the cubane. And we speculated, these are amino acids, we speculated about this being the possible site for water oxidation uh, to make dioxygen here. And we said that these could be possibly the substrate water molecules. This is in 2004. And I also, it, I, wrote, I wrote in the science paper, but I also wrote in another paper published in uh, 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 physical chemistry, uh, in PCCP, um, which, which uh, suggested this mechanism, uh, which had been hinted fr uh, from chemi other people, said maybe this mechanism might be applied, a nucleophilic attack mechanism. And the, and the structure shouted it out. Here was a bimetal center with uh, this dangular manganese going to a high valency state. Do you remember in S3, it was uh, all four manganese four. In the final step to S4, this could become a manganese five. This would become highly electrophilic oxo, electrons being drawn out from that oxygen. And here would be a water molecule, another substrate water molecule, in the coordination sphere of calcium. And that would attack that, and you would form dioxygen. So the, these will be protonated in earlier stages to induce protons. So I will come back to that. But already I had suggested this a mechanism in 2004. Unfortunately, the, the, the structure, the cubane structure and the mechanism wasn't taken too seriously at that time because, one, it was relatively low resolution, but, but because uh, a, 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 a group in groups actually in... Um, in Berkeley and in, uh, in Berlin, uh, almost clubbed together, I think, really, to uh, discredit it by saying that, the, the, that the, it was all wrong, uh, that there was x-ray damage uh, due to, uh, during the collection of the data. Uh, that this was a common problem with metalloproteins. And actually, the paper they published in Science in 2006, where water is oxidized to dioxygen, the structure of the photosynth photosynthetic manganese calcium cluster, was completely different to, uh, to uh, the structure that we had got from X ray crystallography. Uh, they said that this cubane model of Fiera, us, uh, was totally wrong due to radiation damage and did not fit polarized excess data. So, this caused actually a lot of confusion in the field. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a paper wrong. We've all had papers wrong, right? But, it's, it, but people didn't understand because they're a very um, well-known group working on manganese cluster, man the manganese cluster photosystem too. However, so I think in a sense, the, the mechanism I was suggesting at that time didn't really um, uh, have much impact. Now, all, it all changed to 2011 when colleagues in Japan obtained a structure, this is seven years on from us, 
seven years on, uh, a structure at a higher resolution at 1.9 angstroms. And at that resolution, it's possible to see the manganese atoms themselves. And they, they concluded, indeed, that the cluster was, uh, this is ours, uh, 2004, was a cubane structure. And they, they uh, identified, as best they could, because even at this resolution, you can't really see an oxygen, but uh, that there was an additional oxygen bridging across to this manganese 4. So that it was a manganese 4 calcium O5. Uh, just about a year or so ago, 2015, a group in, uh, in China synthesized uh, uh, this cluster, which is the same as uh, uh, you know, manganese 4 calcium O4. And you can see that synthesized cluster obtained at very high re X-ray resolution is more or less the same as what we have postulated from our original X-ray data. So, they, uh, so um, uh, that really meant a lot to me because it proved that what we had suggested uh, I mean, had been, um, to some extent, poo-pooed, uh, was uh, correct at that time. Uh, there had also been other people who had been uh, doing, um, uh, trying to make this, um, synthesize this cluster. And I, I, I want to particularly mention um, this one here, which is, uh, has a calcium there, that's manganese, and the calcium here. And this was done by George Christou uh, in uh, Florida. And he came to me and he told me that they had synthesized this, but he was scared to publish it because nobody would accept it as being an analog for our structure. However, he finally did, after, uh, in 2012, he did finally uh, publish it when they realized that indeed um, it was uh, a, a uh, an analog of the uh, natural um, uh, um, catalytic center. And there's the Zhang model that I've mentioned already. And this is the work of, um, of uh, Theo uh, Apopi uh, in Caltech. He's uh, synthesized the asymmetric cubane with calcium and three manganese. And that's just the regular cubane that you get with four manganese and calcium, so, which was a well-known structure. So uh, then there's another, th uh, another th uh, 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 aspect of this which became very important to me, but was to I was told about it by Robert Huber, who obtained the Nobel Prize for the structure of the Bacterial Reaction Center. And he told me, after I gave a lecture in Cardiff, that there was another uh, catalytic center which was very similar in geometry to, uh, this is uh, our PS2 structure, or the PS2 structure. And this was the uh, structure of the catalytic center of carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. And it had three ions bring, bridged by sulfurs uh, with a nickel. So it, he it was uh, a heter a heterogeneous uh, cubane uh, with an iron, a dangling iron, like we have the dangling manganese. And you can see that they're rather similar. Despite being different elements, they actually uh, 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 fit on each other quite, uh, quite closely. And so it's a very unusual, this is a very unusual structure. I've got to say that when we suggested it, it did not exist in, bio, in, in chemistry. And, uh, and this uh, is also this very unusual uh, cubane structure. Now, what does carbon, mon uh, uh, carbon monoxide dehydrogenase does? It, it reacts with, uh, with carbon monoxide, water and carbon monoxide to form carbon dioxide to release hydrogen uh, from water. So you're using the energy of the oxidation of carbon monoxide, as you know, is energetically uh, will burn and so on. So that, that energy is used to, to extract reducing equivalents uh, for, from water, so it's splitting water, to drive metabolism, just like we extract hydrogen from water to drive metabolism. So they're, op they're both oxygen, uh, uh, oxygen tra atom transfer reactions here. So very, very similar, and in a sense doing similar, a similar f with a similar function. Now I have to watch the time. Um, so here, here, here's a diagram, and I've written about this in a paper in Nature uh, Plants recently. Uh, you can see the, um, uh, the photosystem two, what I told you before, the nucleophilic attack of an OH, uh, uh, the coordination of calcium onto this oxygen. And here uh, is a similar nucleophilic attack of an OH here onto the carbon uh, to, uh, to f for the oxidation of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And there's the two equations 
I've already mentioned. So that's led me with much more confidence to the scheme for uh, uh, dioxygen formation in photosynthesis. And the scheme really is just uh, an expansion of what I've told you. Here's what I've already told you in S4 state, the, the eutrophilic attack. And this will be the S0 state. Now, there's evidence that there are two water molecules coming from the high resolution structure ligated to the manganese and the calcium. And I believe that's some sort of carousel mechanism, and these, uh, which allows uh, a, 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 a new reactant to replace. Uh, the old reactor once the OO bond formation in order to keep a high turnover rate. And here are the two reactive uh, substrate water molecules. One becomes deprotonated, you use an electron to P680 and a proton. Then you have an OH, then you go another, you, you lose only at this stage an electron, and therefore you accumulate a positive charge. Um, and then uh, you go to S3, you lose a, a proton and an electron. And now we've got four, uh, three manganese four. We've got a positive charge. The whole thing is extremely positive and can act as an oxidizing battery. One more flash of light, and you end up here with a manganese five. It could be a manganese four radical. Uh, and, and, that, and that positive charge drawing electrons out and uh, facilitating this uh, nucleophilic attack. And I believe this is, I, I've pub I, I'm not the only one that suggested this, by the way. Um, uh, uh, others have been uh, advocates of such a mechanism, like uh, 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 Gary Brovick at Yale. And, uh, I, but I published it uh, just recently in Nature Plants. Now, uh, we go to the next one. This mechanism of eucophilic attack of a water molecule onto a highly electrophilic oxo uh, seems to be uh, happening in a number of uh, model systems. Uh, for example, mononuclear ruthenium organocomplexes uh, will uh, uh, seem to, um, um, which can have very high turnovers of oxygen formation, uh, uh, driven by the addition of uh, 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 CE with this high, very high oxidant, uh, cesium-4. Uh, and here you have uh, here you have ruthenium-5 with a water attack to form uh, a peroxy, uh, peroxide and ultimately to form the oxygen. You can have radical coupling as well, but with, di with dinuclear ruthenium complexes, you can get radical coupling as well. Uh, this is uh, some work done again by um, uh, colleagues in Sweden, actually, um, uh, Ling Chao Sun, uh, using a manganese-based um, um, catalyst and again, showing a nucleophilic attack, uh, they believe, uh, from a manganese 5, just as we were postulating PS2, uh, onto, uh, uh, on, onto this highly electrophilic, um, hi, uh, uh, this is highly electrophilic oxo, and, th and the OH is coming from a water, a, a solvent water. Now, this uh, brings us a little bit to uh, Li Lydia, because with Lydia, um, Lydia Wong, who's our uh, cha cha uh, what do you call yourself, master of ceremonies, uh, a chairman. Um, uh, Lydia, uh, during our ta my time here in uh, NTU, uh, was able to grow uh, with her co uh, uh, students um, nano rods of hematite, and um, and. Uh, recently, uh, which evolve oxygen as a, pho as a photo anode. So you shine light on them, uh, you produce um, uh, a, a charge transfer complex, and the oxidant is, uh, uh, in, in the valency band, is sufficient to drive the production of oxygen from water. So this is just stimulating it with manganese. So this is work done here at NTU. And um, my ex-PhD student, actually, James Durrant, uh, who uh, uh, collaborates a great deal with Michael Gretzel, uh, has suggested that the mechanism of OO, OO bond formation here under high light intensities is due to uh, uh, a nuclear uh, nucleophilic mechanis uh, a mechanism similar to the one that I've uh, been advocating for photosystem two. So here we have a hematite, a to totally inorganic semiconductor system uh, which seems to be uh, making oxygen in the same way. This, again, gives credibility, I think, to the, um, to the PS2 uh, um, uh, concept of nucleophilic attack. This, pa this, this paper just showed the different kinetics at different light intensities. And finally, 
since uh, Michael's here, and as it was said, if it wasn't for Michael Gretzel, I wouldn't be here today. Oh, we'd be here this afternoon anyway. And he, it's just wonderful that he's come all the way over. But we've even collaborated uh, and with, uh, with uh, Lydia and her students uh, by uh, taking our system that we've developed. He has another system for developing nanoparticles of hematite. But these um, uh, nanorods were put out as a photo anode. And here, for Oskite, this is where Michael's part came in, uh, was used as the second light reaction tandem system where this is producing electrical potential to overcome the shortcomings of the uh, iron in terms of producing enough reducing potential to make hydrogen. And this system will make hydrogen using a platinum electrode. So it's a very, if you like, a very cheap um, electro, uh, electro, uh, electro, um, electrolysis, I suppose we might call it, powered by a, um, a photovoltaic system. That's it. Oh, that even works. Uh, there is nothing, what I've talked about, in a sense, there is nothing new about it. We know about electrolysis. We know we have photovoltaics that we can drive the splitting of water into oxygen and hydrogen. So the splitting of water to make oxygen and hydrogen and have a fuel from sunlight it's not a dream. Uh, it's not like nuclear fusion, which is another big alternative. Fusion is extremely difficult to do, and it's never been proven that we ever will be able to do it, especially on a large scale. But there's no reason why we can't use this mass of sunlight, or sunlight that we have, or oh no, I rarely bother, um, uh, to drive a photovoltaics either incorporated in the system or uh, delocalized from the system. To, to make uh, oxygen and hydrogen and to use this as a fuel. It's the perfect solution. It was the solution used by, uh, uh, by biology in photosynthesis. There's no reason why we can't uh, repeat it. If the leaf can do it, so can we. You're right on time. Right on time. Yes, that's a, a, a miracle. Um, <laughs> are we going to have questions? Or? Um, but of course, if you have any more quick questions or comments from the audience. I've come a long way to hear some intelligent questions. Come on. <laughs> oh, we, can, we, can, we can save the discussion for later on during the panel discussion. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you.